I've been chatting with Hastings Moy MP Sally Ann Hart this week. Top of the agenda, of course, was COVID and the situation in our local hospitals and the conditions that our doctors and nurses are facing every day. We chatted about the vaccine rollout programme and just how much longer is lockdown going to last for. We touched on Brexit too because Mrs Hart's quite frank about the fact that she's not happy with the fisheries element of the trade deal that the government negotiated just before the end of last year and she'd like to see our fishermen get a better deal. We also found out what life's like for a local MP in this pandemic world that we live in. My name's Stuart Bailey. This is Hastings in Focus. Before inevitably we get to talk about COVID, um, you put out a press release yesterday about Project Adar. Um, yes. About the money that's coming to town to combat drugs. That's yes. something you, you seem particularly pleased about. Yes, I am. And I think it's something that we, we know we've got a, a major drugs issue in Hastings. And it's always been one of the things that I've um, uh, really been concerned about and written about in the past, the importance of really um, getting to grips with our drug uh, problem because it has an impact on people's health and uh, um, livelihoods as well. So I was really pleased that um, the government has taken this initiative and Hastings has been chosen as a town where this money is going to be invested. And it's not just about um, combating the criminal gangs that are, you know, um, facilitating these drugs and selling them. It's actually about providing that um, more support in rehabilitation, uh, which I think is really important because yes, drugs are terrible, but once someone gets addicted to them, it becomes a health issue. And then you've really got to focus on that side. So it's, I think it's really good news for Hastings. So and it will be good news for our town centre as well. Yeah, just so choking off the market by, by getting- Yes, to... yeah. Yeah, and Sussex police have already been extremely successful in their county lines. Um, you know, they're fighting against county lines and picking up and arresting people. They really have been focusing on so focusing on that. So this project and the funding they will get will really help them uh, fight against county lines, but also address those drug issues we've got. Good news. Um, so as I say, inevitably COVID. Um, I mean, Hastings went from having some of the lowest infection rates, in fact, the deal was, I think, at one time, to the highest. Is there any indication of why that happened? Why, why that <laughs> so um, I know the, um, I think it was the University of Sussex, it could have been Bright, University of, Bright, um, of um, Brighton that did a study on it, but I, I think part of the reason why we had such low infection rates first time round is because the, re the restrictions came before the virus really had a chance to get hold a hold down here. And so we got off relatively lightly in the spring. Uh, and then again, we had this new variant that came pretty quickly after the tier two, tier three measures. And um, it just has completely gone off the record. And so we've had very high rates of coronavirus, but they are coming down, Stuart. I saw the rate for Hastings today is just between four and 500 per 100,000. And that, at the, the worst, it was, it was over 1,100 per 100,000. So that rate is coming down. So all I can say is thank you to everyone for really sticking to those guidelines, social distancing, because it's the measures that really matter in getting those rates down. And in terms of the vaccination rollout, um, are you happy with the way that's going locally? Is that going? As expected. So I think it's it's been fantastic in Hastings. We've got a hospital that was a hub that's been vaccinating and King's uh, Church at the Hastings Centre has really worked hard and they've been doing vaccines for quite a considerable time. Um, I know that there is a new pharmacy that should be up and running next week, but we can't say anything yet because that's not been made um, it's not been publicised, but I can say that there is a, a pharmacy. So in Hastings, it's doing really well. And I think the what's shown is the vaccine programme has worked really well for urban areas. But obviously in rural areas, we've got smaller GP practices and um, a more dispersed population. So it's proved more problematic, but it is now working in the Rother area. We've got a, a hub set up for the Rother uh, 
primary care network, which is the GPs in there, and that's at Etchingham. And the vaccination started yesterday at Etchingham. So it is getting out. So I've had, that's been uh, one of my biggest preoccupations for the last three weeks is sort of talking to people, pushing, encouraging, asking the government to change policy and various things and working with the local clinical commissioning group that are rolling out the vaccine and really trying to work out the best way of getting the vaccines out to rural areas. There's still a lot to be done, but we're on the right track. The care homes are being vaccinated and the government has that 15th of February for everyone over 70 to be vaccinated. And across East Sussex, the vaccines are going really well and the rural areas will catch up. And one of the things that struck me since since the new year, since the, this current lockdown was, was imposed, is that some of the government's messaging is, I suppose, frankly, all over the place. I mean, I think it was last Sunday we had Matt Hancock was on the front pages saying, we're on the home straight, we you know, doing well. Dominic Vab then popped up saying, oh, well, it's going to be Easter before we're out of this. I noticed today that Patrick Vallance had said, well, we may need to, to stay this way into the summer. And I think most recently, and I know you've been meeting, so you probably haven't sort of seen this bit, but yeah, a spokesman for the Prime Minister has refused to rule out the, the possibility of lockdown continuing to summer. The government are giving us a lot of stick, but not a lot of carrot. Uh, and that mixed messaging of, of where the end point's going to be, it's like you know, offering to pardon a condemned man and then snatching it away. Yes, it's, uh, I completely get that. And, you know, I look at it and I, I see it from, you know, I sort of look at it and I think the, the scientist, Chris Whitty, absolutely fantastic, but he only has to focus on the health aspects and the politicians have to focus on the health and the economy. And so they have to get that balance right. So this is a very fast moving, ever changing situation. And, you know, it can change from one day to the next. I mean, you know, when just looking at the vaccine programme, you know, I didn't give a date to start the Atchingham hub in case it didn't start because the vaccines didn't come for whatever reason. So there is a, a question of perhaps not you don't want to overpromise. you don't want people to to raise their expectations and then they're disappointed and I think it's the same with the messaging for coronavirus we want to give that hope people want to know when they can get back to normal but you know in many ways it's very difficult to put a date on that it depends how the virus goes how the rates come down what the hospital um, capacity is like and you know we've just got to just keep going um, all of us, I know it's tough, everyone's fed up with it, um, fed up with the restrictions, the businesses are suffering, um, but as long as we just keep pulling together, social distancing, applying those restrictions, we can bring those rates down and it shows that restrictions do work because our rates in Hastings and Rother are now down. And then we can try and go back to normal, but it's very difficult to put a time scale on it, realistically, isn't it? In some ways, it almost seemed as the, as the vaccines were being approved and we had this really good news that vaccines were now available, that the, there was almost then a need to damp down the excitement. Yes. Um, because it was so that people didn't think the vaccine was going to provide some kind of instantaneous cure or, or, or medical. Well, you still have to make sure that you're very careful for the two weeks after you're vaccinated because it doesn't give you instant immunity. So I think that's the thing is that people think, oh, the vaccines are coming, we'll get a vaccine, we can just go out and let rip. That's not the case. We've still got to be so careful. And, you know, with our death rates in Hastings yesterday being the highest so far, I think that message really has to continue that we're not out of the woods yet. So keep at it. Let's all just keep at it. Heads down. <laughs> Is the government concerned about any public backlash? Because keeping people under what was effectively house arrest for, you know, if Patrick Valance is correct, for the first six months of the year, would, will people wear that? Will they, will they, they stick with that, that plan for that long? I, I think it's very tough on everyone. I mean, I'm fed up. I don't know about you, Stuart, but I am so oh, yeah. fed up of my. <laughs> but I know that we have to just keep going. And I think, you know, when I, you know, most people I deal with 
really understand the need for the restrictions. Everyone is fed up, but they know that for the greater good, for the to look after each other in our community, we've just got to toe the line. There are, of course, those people who just don't think restrictions apply to them and they just sort of deliberately flout them. Uh, and that is tough because other people get upset. They say, you know, why are they not wearing a face mask? Why are they, you know, not doing this? And I think that's that's really tough. I think the government, you know, the prime minister has been loath to impose restrictions. And I know that he has because, you know, we are a conservative government. He's a libertarian. And it's really hard to come into government and then take away people's liberties and, and impose restrictions on them saying you can't hug your granny, you can't hug your grandchildren. That's really tough. Mm. And um, the backlash, I think, I just hope that it isn't. It's, you know, I know people have been unhappy with some of the messaging, with the restrictions, with the damage to businesses. But what else could we do? I mean, you know, we've seen places like America and Sweden where they didn't have the level of restrictions, but their health and their economy is really no better off. Mm. And when you see pictures of New York with the trenches being dug with, you know, coffins lined up, that's quite tough to watch that. So I think, you know, history will tell whether we've done the right thing. But I know, speaking to the prime minister, that Yes, concerned about the economy, absolutely. But the Conservative Party, you know, we are a party that people can be relied on in terms of the economy, and that still continues. And that's why we've bailed people out and furloughed people and done the businesses so that when the economy does come back, it will come back quicker because people can just step on from where they've left off. But, you know, when you're talking about people, and I, you know, some people say don't waste vaccines on the elderly. That's what I get sometimes. But if you value everyone equally in society, regardless of their age, their sac their sex or their ethnic um, minority race, we cannot differentiate. So we've got to make sure that everyone is safe and saving lives is the priority of this government. And saving lives, when you put a high value on life, it does come at an economic cost. The, the issue of saving lives is, is, is another one that's been yeah. you know, lots, of, lots of coverage about because while we are preventing COVID deaths, there's the risk to, there's um, you know, pieces about the number of um, cancer appointments that are being missed, yeah. cancer treatments that are being postponed, issues with heart disease, I, mean, I think SANE, the mental health charity, is suggesting that suicide is up by 200% year on year. And then I think that the, there's an acceptance that there will be a kind of an economic, you know, not quite catastrophe, but there's going to be serious economic problems. And when we have serious economic problems, the death rate always increases. So while we're saving people from COVID, is there a risk that we are you know, stowing something up? That, that, that at the end of the day, the net number of deaths, whether we've done this or whether we um, are, are, are still going to be high because we're causing deaths. Yes, I, I completely get that. And I know that during the first lockdown, they did suspend a lot of the normal services in the hospital um, because they had no idea what to expect. Whereas this time they've maintained the services. So one of the pressures on the NHS is to try and maintain normal services as much as possible with the COVID on the top. And obviously they have, I know that they've, they've had to cut back on, cut back not in terms of finances, but actual um, the services of elective operations, for example, because they're just so overrun. Um, but I can absolutely say, and I shouldn't say this, but I had to go to the doctor for something and I was in to the hospital in a normal processes and luckily everything was fine. But actually, I've had extremely good treatment um, over the Christmas period uh, for something and they were doing it for everyone. It was normal procedure and I just couldn't believe how um, efficient it all was, Stuart. I really worried about the knock-on effect on cancer patients and obviously the mental health so there's there's investment in mental health and everyone is aware of the mental health and it's schools are talking about it universities are talking about it it's really really important that we get that support going on but when when i signed graham brady's amendment um, you know wanting to look at the cost benefit analysis and bringing 
it back to Parliament to make those decisions. And so when I did all the research about cost benefit analysis on, you know, if you do this, what happens to why? It was so clear that there were so many permutations and so many unknowns that it would have taken weeks to work out what the cost benefit analysis was if you do this, but you don't do that. And I just thought actually at the end of the day, um, only history will, only hindsight will tell whether we did the right thing. And I think that, I hope that coming when we get there and you know, I'd like to see an inquiry into the pandemic and how it was handled and what we could have done better. If we need to know that because if it happens again, we need to know what we need to do better. Uh, and I think that's something that we've all got to learn from. Not just on a personal basis, but as an MP, and I think at the time of looking at that cost benefit analysis issue, you did some tours of the hospital, because I know you, yes. you, you wrote a letter to constituents about that. So I mean, what, what were you seeing when you were actually in the conquest? Well, I was seeing, you know, so when I went in um, that time, when I was doing that, um, the thing that really triggered it for me to support the restrictions back then was the fact that the hospital knew they were gearing up for a second wave. And the bravery of the staff was just amazing. You know, they, what really gets me, and it's when, you know, you hear people saying about, I don't believe in restrictions, and they go out and they flout the rules. Those hospital staff are putting their lives at risk every day to deal with patients and they will still deal with a patient who's been out and don't care about their safety because they're not applying the regulations. So they will treat everybody the same. And I think that's what really got to me is they were so brave. They were gearing up for the second wave. They knew it was coming and they were quite anxious about it. And, and you know, when you go into the hospital, when I was in recently, you know, I get videos sent to me of um, from people being in other hospitals. Um, you know, it's all empty. It's complete rubbish. There's no one in the hospital. Of course, there isn't. There isn't anyone in the entrance and in the corridors, because as soon as you open those wards, it is teeming with action. And, you know, they're so efficient. Um, we don't want to see people in um, on gurneys on the corridors, because then it really would be a disaster. I presume you are on a fully regular basis, in touch with the hospital authorities and you know, oh, the yes. doctors and the people who are at the sharp end. Um, I mean, what, what are they telling you life's been like in recent weeks? Well, it's tough. I mean, um, there's a great chap in the hospital called Ash Subramanian who's um, doing this book and it's sort of organic. So he's asked if I will, you know, uh, help him introduce to some people, but there are people, there's artists, there's texts, and he's putting together this book and there are people, photographs of nurses with tears in their eyes because they're in so much pain because of the PPE they're wearing has created bruising. So, you know, it is tough. And you know, we're in, so I work a huge amount with my fellow East Sussex MPs, Hugh Merriman, Nurse Garney, Maria Caulfield and Caroline Alsall, we're a team and we really fight on behalf of East Sussex together and that is really helpful. And we have at the moment throughout the pandemic, regular meetings, at the moment we've got meetings with the CCG once a week and briefings, we get um, tomorrow, we've got a meeting with the hospital trust, we have regular updates, they feed to us what they need from national government and we listen and try and get the message out to constituents. I think the communication over the vaccines was tricky to start with because, you know, with the vaccines, the it's intermittent because the manufacturing process with the vaccines uh, hasn't quite gotten to its stride yet with the Oxford AstraZeneca. It takes a long time to make these vaccines. And so it's very difficult to prepare in advance for the number of vaccines coming, which is causing difficulties, but that will get better as time goes on. So yes, communicating a huge amount of the time uh, yeah. with um, local hospital trust, the CCG, GP doctors, yeah. Keeping up to date. I mean, the other side of this, and, and, and we touched on that, that briefly a, a couple of minutes ago, is that issue of, for business. Yeah. Last summer, you, a, a phrase you used quite often, but turbocharging the economy. And yet, I think some figures that were done by John Bonus, the, the town centre manager, just before Christmas, I think was showing that of the hospitality businesses that tried to be open, 90% of them were unable to 
make a profit. They were, they were running at a loss. And Hastings and advise constituency, we've got lots of you know, artisan crafts and lots of small businesses for whom the business is the way they make their living, not necessarily, it's very small scale. I mean, what can you say to those people who's the small gin owners, and I know, I know a couple of them, who you know, have been shut down um, and, and are really, really struggling and, and are not sure whether they can hold on um, I know. to the other side of this. And I've heard from so many business and independent retail shops as well have really suffered as well, Stuart. And it is a real problem. I mean, uh, I know the government has offered economic package and its support. Um, you know, we've had uh, business grants and, um, and ex you know, the VAT um, cut uh, for hospitality and uh, tourism businesses with business rate reduction schemes and things like that. And I think it's been really, really tough on our local businesses and it's incredibly challenging time. I mean, I'm supporting and lobbying at the moment for the extension of the VAT cut to go right through this year to next year and to have that um, business rate holiday for uh, local businesses, because I think um, that's so important to give them a bit of breathing space to, to really work on this year and to have that breathing space. And I think that, um, you know, we have had funds, but I recognise that it is challenging and we've got to do everything we can do um, to make, um, you know, to make it easier. So once we get beyond the COVID-19, we've got a great opportunity in this area to turbocharge our local economy by encouraging domestic tourism. So, you know, I think, you know, last summer showed that actually the businesses bounced back quite quickly and they were able to really um, fly during the summer. Unfortunately, they couldn't really take advantage of the Christmas time and the Christmas rush. So that's been really tough for them. But if we can really get them up and running with help from the government that they're getting, turbocharge the economy, encourage domestic tourism and reaching and trying reaching out to high skilled and high paying businesses to actually get more people in there um, you know we're working on uh, at the moment um, a round table we're setting up with the defense industries in the town um, to see if we can get more procurement down there so that they can expand and increase the skilled jobs around here so actually what uh, what we really um, need to do is um, to just you get as much government support as we can, whether it's in skills, whether it's loans, grants and everything else to keep those businesses afloat so that once the pandemic gets over, they can get back in there. I know it's hard, Stuart. It's really, really tough. And because you, you famously are, are, are aware, I'm not quite sure whether, what tends to use these days, but the great support of Brexit, which of course has now happened. Does the fact that we are out of the EU, provide greater opportunities for those businesses once once this is over? Definitely. I mean, I, um, uh, I just, you know, we still trade with the EU, absolutely. And I know there are businesses in Hastings that actually they do trade with the EU, but we've got businesses that trade with other countries without a free trade deal. So you can still trade with other countries without a free trade deal. But I think the government is supporting small businesses, especially in global trade. And I think it's worth businesses looking on the government's website into how they get support from government to do that, marketing and all sorts of things. There is a global, we have got now the agility without being part of a big block to really look at our global Britain and to look at, you know, that global trade. You know, we've got the whole world open to us. And I think that's so important. I, mean, I suppose the Brexit has been the other big issue of, of, the, of the last few weeks, we, we finally, um, finally broken free. Um, the, there was the, the drama almost as we came up to New Year, to the negotiation of the, the, the trade deal. I mean, what were your feelings when you actually saw what was finally being put out there as I, as I do with you? Yes. Specific, so <laughs> Obviously, I didn't see the deal immediately. So, um, you know, I was encouraged by the fact that it was a great deal. You know, we were at, we've got our sovereignty back. We take control of our sovereign waters, et cetera, et cetera. There was a good deal for X, a good deal for Y, a good deal for fisheries. So I thought, yes, this is great. 
And of course, when you actually get to look at it and you see just um, particularly for the fisheries, um, I was bitterly disappointed about that. And I know that our local fishermen are as well. Um, and, but, you know, when you are an MP, so I supported the deal, even though I was bitterly disappointed because it's the deal was so good in so many other ways um, that benefited not just businesses, but, you know, families and communities um, that it, it was the right thing to support the deal. So now I'm working, obviously, with the fishermen with the fisheries minister, with DEFRA, with a group of uh, conservative MPs who formed a fisheries group now. And we are really working together to get the best possible deal for our fishermen moving forward and also to lobby for the funding for them. Um, we've got a hundred million fund for investing in our fisheries communities and our fishing industries. And the government announced this week because there's been some real issues with exporting. Um, over uh, exporting seafood and fish. So uh, I was pleased to hear um, a fund announced, I think it was yesterday or the day before for 23 million. And that is specifically to cover losses that our fishermen and, and export fishing export businesses have suffered because of the export difficulties. Cause that actually has been outrageous. The difficulties that have been faced there. I mean, I, I, am I right in saying that you know, while the negotiation on, on the, the main part of the deal ended in December, presumably negotiations and adjustments and negotiations yeah. and tweaks to it are going to be continuing? Yes, and, you know, I don't, you know, we've got the deal, but there'll be so many other things that we have to agree. You know, there's, the, you know, defence moving forward. Um, you know, things like climate change initiatives and all that sort of thing. So, yes, there will be obviously an ongoing relationship with the U European Union. There's bound to be. It's not just a free trade deal that we have with them. We have so many other things that we do together with them. Yeah. yeah. Um, as I said, you know, we covered COVID, we, we talked about Brexit. Is there, is there time for anything else at the moment? I mean, I, I've noticed... <laughs> The, the, the government published a, a paper on the, the future of education this morning. Which, yes, love it. Well, and, and where I have seen it reported, it's been getting you know a good response, but it hasn't really gained a great deal of traction in the news media today. No, we have, uh, to, we have to look for it. We have to look for it, and it's a really good initiative. So something that I spoke to um, when I first became an MP about to the Chamber of Commerce about you know, and the um, Further Education College about businesses, you know, working with the college to uh, tell them what skills they need so that we can employ local people. Well, that's really what this white paper is about, business-led um, education, really. And it's really good news on that. And also about local skills, plans and things. I'm really excited about it. Yes, it's funny because we've had COVID, we've had the deal, but you know, the government has done so many other things as well in the, in this, in, in the past year. You know, we've had the increase in defence, we've had defence, we've got police stuff, we've got Project Adder. There are so many other things that have been happening all the time, believe it or not. Because if we hadn't had COVID and we had the Brexit deal, there'd have been an awful lot of newspaper pages being filled with an awful lot of other news, which of course... Well, yes, <laughs> but they might have been able to focus more on good news stories, Stuart. So there, there are, there are yes. some. There uh, are some, yeah. I mean, there are a lot, actually, I should say that. There are a lot of good news stories, yeah. Um, and yeah, from your perspective, as a local MP, um, it, you are, we, we get lots of comments, oh yeah, your MPs on holiday again, or MPs not in the West Wind. But I would imagine, that especially over the last year, you, you probably haven't had a great deal of time off, I would imagine. And, and not just you, but all 600 and odd MPs are, are in the same boat. I think that's right. And I remember someone writing in to me um, over the Christmas period, I think it was between Christmas and New Year, and uh, writing in about how come you get have to go one day back and you get another whole week's holiday and I said it's not a week's holiday I was very lucky to get three days off over Christmas 
Um, but I can't believe people were actually emailing me on Christmas Day, Stuart. I didn't look at my emails on Christmas Day. No, it's been exhausting, I have to say. Uh, um, uh, the, a lot of MPs are quite tired and, um, you know, I have had a week off since I've become an MP, which has been great, a whole week off. But um, I think no one ever expected, um, none of us did, that you know in the within three months of becoming an MP we'd be facing a, a pandemic mm. with serious health and economic implications and we've just got to keep working and making sure that we're doing the best for our constituents the local residents and the businesses Stuart and that is what I am constantly trying to do.